questions, Kessio Rao, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Le Comité pour la Sécurité. Mr. Speaker, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians has indicated that members of this House purposely helped hostile foreign actors. Canadians have a right to know who and what the information was. The committee indicates there are members of this House that have knowingly worked for foreign hostile governments. Canadians have a right to know who and what is the information. Who are they? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition knows very well that no government, including the government of which he was a member, is going to discuss particularities of intelligence information publicly, so he knows better than that. But the good news, Mr. Speaker, is if he wanted to get the appropriate security clearance and be able to see the confidential report of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, he would be much more informed than he is now, and we would invite him to do so, so he wouldn't stand up and cast aspersions on the floor of the House of Commons without any information whatsoever. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we don't need secrets and confidentiality. That's what got us into this problem in the first right. place. What we need are the facts so that Canadians can judge. Just like in the case of the Green Slush Fund, the, the Auditor General revealed $123 million of spending that broke the rules, $59 million of projects that never should have been awarded money at all, $76 million in money gone to companies connected to the Liberal appointed members, including two hundred and seventeen thousand to the chair of the fund that was giving out the money will the government support our common sense plan to hand over all this information to the RCMP for a police investigation the honorable deputy prime minister mr speaker it is no surprise that today the conservatives don't want to talk about the economy but we know that the economy is the issue that most concerns Canadians. Step it. Right. And that is why I am so glad to share some great news. Today, the Bank of Canada lowered interest rates. After nine years of this Prime Minister, with the support of the Bloc Québécois, Montreal is in a state of chaos, crime, drugs and disorder. Children need police escorts to go to preschool. So will this government accept the Conservative demand to refuse the exemption to the Criminal Code? in order to prevent supervised injection sites from opening next to preschools and schools. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, once again, it's not surprising that the Conservative leader does not want to discuss the economy. But we know that the economy is the issue that Canadians care about the most. And that is why I'm so happy to share a piece of good news, which is that today the Bank of Canada lowered the benchmark in the benchmark interest rate. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. And interest rates remain 20 times higher than they were when that member promised that they would go down. Remember when she said the big risk was deflation and low rates? Well, she was exactly wrong then, and she's even more wrong now. Mr. Speaker, 
six years ago, I said there was a carbon tax cover-up. The government wouldn't reveal the true cost of its carbon tax. Then they published information claiming everyone was better off. Now we find out that there is a secret report showing that with the economic costs considered, the vast majority of Canadians are paying more. Will the government end the gag order, stop the carbon tax cover-up, and release the report? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister Finette. You know, Mr. Speaker, it is just really sad, sad. and shameful sad. that the Conservatives continue to talk down the Canadian economy and that they are unable to celebrate our great country. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, this has been a great week for Canada. Yes. First, the Oilers made it to the Stanley Cup. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, the government has put the parliamentary budget officer under a gag order. In fact, I have a copy of the gag order right here. And it says, this is a letter from the, from the Environment Minister to the parliamentary budget officer. The department is providing information that, that is unpublished. As such, I request you to ensure that this information is used for your office's internal purposes only and is not published or further distributed. They don't want Canadians to know the true cost of the, of the carbon tax. Why won't they end the gag order, stop the carbon tax cover-up, and release this report today? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The person who seems to be laboring under a gag order is the Conservative leader. Oh. And that gag order seems to prevent him from saying anything positive about our amazing yeah. country. The fact is, today is a day of really good news. The Bank of Canada has lowered interest rates. Canada is the first G7 country to lower rates. Our government's economically responsible plan has created the conditions that made that possible. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, foreign interference is spreading its tendrils right into this House. The National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians has confirmed that MPs have been working under foreign influence right at the heart of our democracy. The committee has to keep things secret, but political parties don't, and they certainly need to take action. Please spare us the list of what the government has already done against interference, because we know it hasn't worked. What will the government do now? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for La Prairie for his question and his involvement, not only in the UG Commission, but I'd also like to thank his party and our other partners for the important work that's being done today. For example, to support Bill C-70 to strengthen our national security institutions and our collective capacity to recognize and fight foreign interference. So I'd like to thank him for that. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, this is important. The parties need to rise above the fray because among us there may be members who knowingly or not are working for other countries. That is extremely serious. I'm calling upon the Prime Minister and calling on all of the leaders of the opposition parties. If someone among us is under foreign influence rather than representing their fellow citizens, they don't belong here and should leave. What will the government do to make sure that happens? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I find it a little surprising that even the Bloc Québécois doesn't want to talk about the economy. Because I know that for Quebecers as well, the economy is the main issue. 
And today, we have a piece of good news, which is that the Bank of Canada has decided to lower the key interest rate. That's good for Quebec. It's good for all of Canada. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The allegation that there are MPs knowingly working for foreign governments to undermine our democracy is deeply serious. That's why I requested a classified briefing to get more information. But the Prime Minister has known about this since March and has done nothing. And the Conservative leader doesn't even want to know what's going on, has refused this information. Why are these two leaders turning away, looking away from foreign interference when it serves them? The Honourable Minister of uh, Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I thank our colleague, the leader of the NDP, uh, for his important work and the work of his House leader in setting up, for example, the commission led by Justice Hugg. I'm very pleased to hear, Mr. Speaker, that he's interested, having received, obviously, the appropriate security clearance, to get all of the confidential information that's behind the important wo uh, work of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Our government created that committee. We appreciate its work. We value its recommendations. We have always acted to put in place strengthened measures when we receive thoughtful analysis, like we did from the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliament and will continue to do that important work. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Known since March and has done nothing. These allegations that MPs may have received assistance from a foreign government, government, that is very troubling. And the Prime Minister has known about this since March 22nd, but has done nothing. And as for the Conservative leader, he doesn't even want to hear about it. Why are these two leaders content with closing their eyes to the reality? Perhaps it's because they think foreign interference favors their chances to win. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thought that the NDP shared our concerns about the cost of living. And that's why it's very surprising to me that the NDP doesn't want to talk about the Canadian economy. Because the reality, Mr. Speaker, is that today we have good news. The Bank of Canada has decided to lower the key interest rate. And that's thanks to our accountable economic plan. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the ENSICOP report makes clear the Prime Minister was advised back in 2018 of the national security threats against Parliament from hostile foreign states. He was advised that measures in place at the time were not sufficient. He was advised to take further action. Three times, the senior civil service asked for his approval for action to protect Parliament in December 2019, in December 2020, and again in February 2022. Three times the Prime Minister withheld that approval. Why? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I think our Honourable colleague knows very well that our government was the first government to put in place a series of measures to strengthen our institutions and our democracy Absolutely. from the threat of foreign interference. Exactly. He knows very well that that threat was identified publicly in 2013 in a CSIS right. report yeah. when the leader of the opposition was responsible for democratic institutions, oh. and they did absolutely nothing, Mr. Zero. Speaker. Zero. So I find it somewhat ironic that my friend would stand in his place and say that our government, the first government to act in this important area and continue to strengthen these measures, hasn't done enough. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the report reveals that parliamentarians, including members of this House, knowingly and wittingly assisted a hostile foreign state in Parliament and in our elections to the detriment of the people of Canada. This is shocking. And Mr. Speaker, I can't believe the following needs to be said. Parliamentarians' duty is not to a foreign state, but to the people of Canada. Simple question. Will the Prime Minister release the names of these parliamentarians? Yeah. The, Honourable Minister, the Honourable Minister of Public Safety and Democratic Institutions. 
Monsieur le Président, mon collègue, c'est... Mr. Speaker, we all know that no responsible government would, would, would reveal names under these types of confidential circumstances. So it's simply not true that a government that cares about Canada's security and our institutions would do such a thing. I am very pleased that there are parliamentarians in this House who have the right security clearance to get all the information that underlies the ENSICOP report. I would invite my colleagues to read that report properly. The Honourable Member from Mégantique l'Érable. Mr. Speaker, this government has tried to deny and diminish the scope of foreign interference in Canada. But the ENSICOP report unmasks this prime minister's guilt and indifference. The report revealed that parliamentarians, including MPs in this House, knowingly helped hostile foreign countries to interfere in this parliament and elections. That all goes against the interests of Canada and Canadians. It's shocking and unacceptable. This prime minister has the power and the duty, especially, to do something about that. Will he reveal the names of these MPs and the information we need to know? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Once again, Mr. Speaker, it's concerning to see how irresponsible our colleagues across the way are. They are asking for something that is simply not done. I would ask my colleague to speak to his own leader and ask him to accept the government's invitation to receive the appropriate security clearance in order to be able to see all of the highly classified information that our colleagues on the National Security Committee have seen. That would perhaps be a more honest way to make a point. The Honourable Member for Regina Capel. The Liberal defence of the carbon tax is in complete shambles. First, they only want Canadians to focus on the direct costs of the carbon tax and ignore all the secondary effects like smaller paychecks and higher prices, as if Canadians have a choice of which carbon tax costs they have to pay. But now we learn that there's a secret report that does show the true cost. The Parliamentary Budget Officer says that it proves that he's right, that the vast majority of Canadians are worse off paying the tax than any rebate they receive. The Liberals claim that it proves they're right. There's an easy way to settle this. Why won't the government just release the report so Canadians can decide? Well, how suit for the government? Mr. Speaker, math is really not the long suit of the party over there. The PBO has specifically said and repeated time after time, you'd think they'd understand that eight out of ten Canadians are better off under the price on pollution than, than uh, in, in the affected provinces. The fact is, though, Mr. Speaker, they talk of gag orders. We haven't seen the member for Peace River Westlock in a long, long time. And what about the former chair of the Status of Women Committee? She, we haven't seen her either. They are not uh, any time uh, going to give less. Just, just need to remind individuals we, we can't say whether someone's here or not, so just to, to be careful on those lines. The Honourable Member for Regina Cabell. Apparently, answering questions doesn't seem to be this minister's long suit, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Their, their responses here are completely ridiculous. They claim that this report exonerates their. Their, uh, their, their, their position, but they won't release it. This is a little bit like someone who's accused of a crime walking into court saying they have an amazing alibi that proves that they're innocent, but they just can't show it to anybody. Here's the thing, Mr. Speaker, if you won't show your evidence to the jury, you're probably guilty. Why not do the easy thing, release the report, remove the gag order so Canadians can decide? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start by wishing a happy World Environment Day to all Canadians, especially to the failed former leader of the Conservative Party, the member from Regina Capel, and the new leader of the Conservative Party from Carleton, who have voted against the environment over 400 times in this House of Commons, Mr. Speaker. It's clear where they stand on climate change, and it's clear where they stand on environmental protections. But Conservatives continue to mislead Canadians. Our government will continue to support the good work of the PBO, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry. 
that conservative math just isn't adding up these days. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Nofort. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know that the Liberal carbon tax increases the cost of everything while failing to bring down emissions. The Parliamentary Budget Officer confirmed that Canadians are paying more than they're getting back from this so-called rebate. The Liberals are clearly afraid that Canadians will know the truth, and that is that the carbon tax has made life unaffordable. That's right. When will this government stop the cover-up? release the report and confirm what we all know, that Canadians are suffering because of this carbon tax. Because of Trudeau. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad the Conservatives are finally asking a couple of questions that are at least, at least in the neighbourhood of the economy. The next step for them is to recognise how significant today is. Today is the day that Canada, first among the G7, lowered interest rates. It the, it's the first time rates have gone down since COVID hit. This is a tremendously important day for Canada, and it is our responsible economic plan that has made it possible. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint-Jean. Well, Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the Prime Minister will finally meet François Legault about immigration. It's high time. For months, he hasn't been doing anything about Quebec's influx of new arrivals. Lon Monday needs to be a turning point. The federal government needs to do something. Quebec has been asking for temporary immigration to be reduced and that French requirements be brought into federal programs. It's also asking for asylum claims to be shared fairly, and it's asking for a reimbursement of $1 billion. So, on Monday, will the Prime Minister finally sign the check on Monday? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I know that the Bloc Québécois wants to speed up the processing of asylum claims, but what's really hypocritical is that they're getting up at the Finance Committee to oppose our reforms which would do exactly that, speed up asylum claims processing. I know that the Premier of Quebec thinks the Bloc Québécois is useless. I don't share that opinion, but I'm starting to lose my convictions in that regard. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the federal government thinks that $1 billion is too much, it could have done something about asylum claims before it could also have reduced that bill by doing its job, especially on work permits. According to Quebec, asylum claims represent 20 percent of people on welfare, not because they don't want to work, but because they're not allowed to do so. Minister Fréchette has confirmed that, on average, they have to wait for work permits for 10 to 11 months. That's what Minister Fréchette said. When will Ottawa stop keeping these people in a life of poverty? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, the entire opposition opposed our reforms on asylum, which would have sped things up. I find it ridiculous. They should admit what they're doing. We've talked about dark and light blue. And as for, and as for Monday's meeting, they'll have to wait until Monday. Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the Liberals are trying to hide what Canadians already know that it's a carbon tax, is a costly scheme that is making everything more expensive. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has already proven that the vast majority of Canadians are worse off economically because of this failed scheme. What we didn't know is that the government are actually went out and did their own economic um, an analysis of the carbon tax, but they're refusing to release it. Why the cover-up? Here, here. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite should be careful what he asks for, but I will reiterate for the, for the, for the benefit of these, this House that 8 out of 10 Canadians are better off today than they were before because of the price on pollution. And as a bonus on this World Environment Day, Mr. Speaker, the uh, environment and
and climate change, we make our contributions to achieving our targets, and we can do Canada's part, as I know all Canadians want to do, in combating climate change. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, all we're asking for is that report to be released so Canadians can see the results, because it's Canadians who are the ones that are paying for this expensive, failed Liberal scheme. So when the government goes through the trouble of putting together a report and, and, and doing the analysis, but keeps that report a secret and doesn't even allow the parliamentary budget officer to talk about it, you have to wonder, how bad is it, Mr. Speaker? When will they end the cover-up and release that report? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And unfortunately for the Conservatives, that's just not what the PBO has said. The Parliamentary Budget Officer issued a report about a month and a half ago saying that he accidentally overestimated the economic impact of the carbon price on Canadians, Mr. Speaker. I would like to re-emphasize for Canadians that 8 out of 10 Canadians get more money back through the Canada carbon rebate than they pay in the price on pollution, Mr. Speaker. And as a reminder, the next payment of the Canada carbon rebate will go out on July 15th in the summer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are hiding the truth from Canadians. The Environment Minister is refusing to release a secret government report that pr proves the carbon tax is costing Canadians more than they get back. In fact, the Liberals have placed a gag order on their own budget watchdog, blocking him from speaking about this damning report. Canadians already know the carbon tax is a complete scam. So when will this Liberal Minister release his secret report and end his carbon tax cover-up? The Honourable Minister of Rural Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I'd like to remind the member opposite that, thankfully, we all passed the Fez last week, and that means in his riding in Manitoba, a family of four is going to receive $1,440 with the rural top-up. In my riding in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's $1,430. In Alberta, it's $2,160. Because no matter how you do the math, Mr. Speaker, eight out of ten families are better off with the carbon rebate, especially families in rural. They We've got that top, that top up. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, after nine years of this Liberal government, life is so expensive and Quebecers are paying the price. Once again this week, the Bloc Liberal Coalition voted against suspending the federal gas tax, which would have given Canadians a break. And the Bloc Québécois wants to radically increase taxes. The Parliamentary Budget Officer confirmed this week at the Finance Committee that the government has a secret report which will prove that the carbon tax has fiscal repercussions. When will the minister publish this report which proves that the Conservatives and Canadians are right? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is ridiculous. Eight out of ten families get more back from the carbon rebate than they pay. Where it applies? It's that simple. This carbon pricing revenue is redistributed among families. Wealthy families pay more than they receive, but middle class and lower income families receive more than they pay. It's just that simple. Eight out of 10 families receive more money in their pockets. Those are middle class and lower income families. In 2011, the Conservatives changed the food mail program that went from helping people in the north to subsidizing rich corporations in the south. Everyone knows it is not working, but the Liberals refuse to reform it. The Northwest Company and the CEO makes millions in profits and bonuses, but people in the north cannot afford to eat. When will the Liberals finally reform the Conservatives' Broken Nutrition North program so it helps to afford, helps people to afford healthy food. The Honourable Minister, Northern Affairs. I thank uh, the Honourable Member for her very important question. We know that uh, the affordability of food nutrition is, is so important in the North. We are committed 100 percent that 100 percent of the retail subsidy will go to Northerners. We are currently doing an internal review of Nutrition North. Once that's done, we will do an external audit. We are committed that 100 percent of the retail benefit will go to Northerners. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Ladysmith. 
Mr. Speaker, families in Nanaimo Ladysmith are struggling to keep up with rising food prices. Yet the Liberals have done nothing to lower the costs, and the Conservatives would rather protect CEO profits. The NDP is giving them a chance today to help Canadians. They can either support our motion to cap the cost of essential foods or keep protecting CEO profits while families go hungry. Which will they choose? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my colleague that food prices is difficult for many families across this country. But they got a bit of good news today, Mr. Speaker. 4.75 is the numbers that Canadians will remember. But if the member really wants to help, she should ask all the members, especially on the opposition, to support us in pushing Walmart and Costco to adopt the grocery code of conduct, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we have been pushing for more competition because we know that more competition will bring stabilizing prices will be more choice for consumers and we'll make sure that you know over time mr speaker canadians will win on that we are committed at every step of the day to fight for canadians and i know that the conservative will vote against that mr speaker but we'll fight for canadians the honorable member for kitchener south hespler Mr. Speaker, as we mark the beginning of Pride season, it is a time to celebrate the 2SLGBTQ plus community and reflect on their accomplishments. However, we know that the rise of hate directed toward this community has made many feel unsafe. Could the Minister of Women and Gender Equality and Youth update the House on our government's efforts to create a safer and more inclusive Canada? The Honourable Minister of Women and Gender Equality. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for her advocacy. As we raised the pride flag a couple of days ago, I announced $1.5 million to offset security costs for pride festivals right across the country. It isn't the kind of announcement I ever want to make, but the queer community feels directly what security agencies tell us. Hate is on the rise. The community asked for help, and we responded. At a time when we're seeing less support for queer communities, our government will never waver. On this side of the House, we support Canadians, no matter who they are, for being their authentic selves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, who's Randy? The Minister of Employment has a 50% stake in a PPE company embroiled in allegations of fraud. Text messages from the COO reveal that a partner named Randy was involved in one of those shady business deals. The Minister assures us it's not him, yet somehow he's unable to identify who the other Randy is amongst a handful of employees. So again, who's Randy? Here, here. The Honourable... The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, of course Canada has among the toughest, most stringent ethics and conflict of interest provisions in the world for public office holders. The, the minister in question uh, appeared yesterday before committee for one hour and answered all of those questions. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, there is no trace of this other Randy. Global News can't find him. The COO claims there is this other Randy, but conveniently has forgotten his last name. And the minister can't identify him among a handful of employees. This is a farce. Everyone knows who Randy is. Will the minister just stand up and admit it's him? Here, 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 here. The Honourable Government House Leader. I'll remind it in French. Canada has one of the strictest uh, ethical and uh, conflict of interest codes in the world for public office holders, and this minister answered for an hour to all of these questions, Mr. Speaker. The member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rita Lakes. The NDP Liberal Minister from Edmonton wants Canadians to think that he's not breaking the law, but he was cashing checks from a company that was lobbying his government, and a company that he owns 50% of was winning government contracts using his name as a minister. He's not allowed to do either. Now, in a global news report this week, text messages reveal someone named Randy at his company was part of a $500,000 fraud. The minister said it wasn't him, it was the other 
Randy. Of course it was. So who is the other Randy and what's his last name? <laughs> I just have to make, uh, be careful in using the proper names of, uh, of individuals in the chamber. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thanks, Speaker. I, of course, just uh, answered that question, so I would invite the member to move on. The Honourable Member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. Well, Speaker, we have the same suspicion as the Speaker does that, in fact, there is perhaps uh, some concern about using the member's name. But, well, the government House Leader wants to hide his member, we're just going to run through a scenario here. What are the chances that the other Randy is just the Minister from Edmonton in a rubber nose and a stick on mustache? I'd say about 100 per cent. Broke the Conflict of Interest Act, broke the Lobbying Act, broke the criminal code. We want to know, will the real Randy please stand up? Please stand. Now, you know, I'm stuck in the middle of this one. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, of course. That's enough. The Honourable Government House Leader. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for that. That is beneath the dignity of this place, where we presume all members are honourable. The member in question spent an hour at committee yesterday answering questions from that member and other members. And of course, uh, I know that uh, the member uh, will continue to ask those questions. I will give the same answer. We have a very strict co code of conflict of interest and ethics in this country, and all ministers are expected to comply with that. With the Honourable Member for Terrebonne. The Auditor General yesterday confirmed what we've suspected for months. You tabled three reports with the same damning conclusion. The Liberals have completely lost control of the government machine. Contracts without calls for tender and without justification. Payments made to companies before they had even delivered anything. Funding for ineligible projects. There is absolutely no oversight of spending. And that brings us back to the question we've been asking for months. Whilst the Liberals are trying to govern Quebec and the provinces for them, who is governing the federal government? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for giving me the opportunity to thank the Auditor General once again for her important work on this file and on a number of other files. We heard the Auditor General yesterday putting forward similar conclusions to the ones published by the government a year ago. Given all this information, we have been acting for the past years to put an end to tendering for Mackenzie. The Honourable Member for Bhopal Limolu. The McKinsey case reveals a decadent culture at the federal level. The Auditor General confirms that one of the $200 million in contracts awarded to McKinsey, that of the $200 million, 71% were awarded without a call for tenders, 58% were awarded without oversight. For 24% of the contracts audited, the federal government did not even know whether the work had been done. This is scandalous. The report makes only one recommendation, that is that all federal organizations identify cases of conflict of interest, whether real or apparent. Will the government finally do it for real? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Auditor General's recommendations are very similar and sometimes identical to those that were already published by, uh, over the past few months. Important uh, work has been done over the past year on the issues that my colleague has raised. What's important to note as well is that not only will we continue to do the work, but we, it's important to do so to ensure the integrity of all procurement process. The Honourable Member for Louis Laurent. Mr. Speaker, another report from the Auditor General and another Liberal scandal. This time it has to do with the Green Fund. We learn that 196 times the administrators gave themselves subsidies. $123 million were inappropriately paid out. About half should never have been paid out in the first place. There's only one way to make the situation clear. 
Does the minister agree with our proposal to have an RCM with having an RCMP investigation? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. We have no lessons to learn from the Conservatives, that's for sure. We were very clear, Mr Speaker. The second there were allegations made, we started our own investigations through Raymond Chabot, through McCarthy Thetro. And you know, Mr Speaker, this is an independent arms length organization that was created by Parliament 20 years ago. But following allegations, we suspended funding. The head of the board of directors resigned. The head resigned. And now we have a new governance model, and the activities will be transferred. Mr. Speaker, we'll have the highest levels of governance, and this is exactly what we'll do. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, in this very report, uh, a senior official says that this. There is an absolute incompetence at the Liberal government and that it is at the level of the uh, sponsorship scandal. On the 11th of November, the whistleblower said, and I quote, the minister said a number of times that he had not been informed of the results put forward by the 27th, on the 27th of August. But no, he lied to the Ethics Committee. Who should we believe, the whistleblower or the minister? The Honourable Minister for Innovation, the Conservatives know full well. We have nothing to learn from them. We started the investigation, Mr. Speaker, through an independent organization. And this was started 20 years ago. Canadians at home are reasonable. They know that a responsible government starts investigations and acts on the conclusions. And that is exactly what we did. And that what we're proposing to Canadians is a new governance model within the National Research Council to continue to work our, uh, to help our SMEs and to continue to fight against climate change and to continue to make our country progress. Member for Brentford Brant. Mr. Speaker, the AG's report proves again this Prime Minister is not worth the cost or corruption. The report reveals massive corruption at the Green Slush Fund, highlighting the misappropriation of $76 million through 90 cases of conflict of wow. interest. Their directors sat at the table, awarded millions of dollars to their friends and to their own business interests, business interests. all the while more and more Canadians are hungry and homeless. The question is simple. What plan does the minister have to get that money back? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative are so allergic to good news that they go to old news, Mr. Speaker. The big news today is 4.75. That's the number that all Canadians will remember. That is the number because we have good economic news. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to answer the same question again. What is a responsible government? It's about lynching and inquiry. That's what we did, Mr. Speaker. And on the basis of the findings, Mr. Speaker, we suspended the funding to the organization. The CEO and the chair resigned, Mr. Speaker. And now we're proposing a new governance model, one with the National Research Council, because we want to restore funding to small and medium-sized businesses in this country, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Mr. Speaker, water is essential for Indigenous communities. It's life. It's sacred. Before 2015, the Conservative government refused to listen to First Nations. At the time, there were 105 long-term drinking water advisories. Can the Minister for Indigenous Services update us on the government's efforts to protect water and invest in infrastructure for our Indigenous communities? The Honourable Minister. Thank you to the member for Pontiac for her work on access to drinking water. In 2015, the Liberal government completely changed the paternalistic approach of Stephen Harper. We now listen to and work closely with Indigenous leaders. Our investment has allowed us to uh, eliminate 144 drinking water advisories. We've also tabled a clean water bill for First Nations so that we'll never go back to where we were before. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. The Auditor General's report proves that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost and the corruption. Most of the government's $200 million in contracts with their friends at McKinsey broke the rules. Liberals are tight with McKinsey. The former ambassador to China and head of the Prime Minister's economic advisory panel came from McKinsey. The policy director to the former Minister of Public Services and Procurement was also McKinsey. This government serves McKinsey consultants and scandalizes Canadians. Why did Liberals repeatedly break the rules to benefit their friends at McKinsey. The Honourable Minister of Public Service and Procurement. Thank you, Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, I've also responded to this question. One question we haven't got an answer to is why are the Conservatives not sharing today's great economic news? The first reduction in interest rates in the past four years and the first in G7 countries, and that is not only because we have been responsible budgetarily, but because Canada in 2025, inaudible for the interpreter, investments in dental care, investments in health care and child care, especially throughout Canada, and investments in, in home building. For Sherwood Park, for Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, it's no surprise that Liberal Minister will do everything to avoid talking about even mentioning McKinsey in the response. Yeah, right minister, this question is about McKinsey. This company supercharged the opioid crisis, advised totalitarian regimes, held a co uh, corporate retreat down the road from a concentration camp. This company has a vile track record, and yet Liberals have constantly turned to this company, supercharging McKinsey's profits, and Liberals have turned to McKinsey to make critical decisions about this country's future. Now that they've finally been caught by the auditor General, will this NDP Liberal government finally ban this vile company from government contracts? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Public Service and Procurement. It may indeed be that our colleague was distracted when I spoke about the matter many times during the question yeah. period. Yeah. I'm happy to repeat the same, the same answer to the same question, which is the fact that we thank the Auditor General for her report. Her report contains recommendations and views that have been understood and heard in many other reports in the previous months. We have acted on those recommendations for more Absolutely. than a year now. There's nothing more to add except that today is an important yes. day for Canadians and their economy. Seem to care. You know, the first time in four years that there is a fall in the interest rate and the first in decrease across Bravo. 47 countries. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Lévis Lodbinière. Mr. Speaker, after nine years of this government, it's not worth the cost nor the corruption. The Auditor General told us yesterday that the government awarded 70 per cent of its contracts directly to McKinsey without a call for tenders with the help of the Bloc Québécois. This is, a, this is blatantly unethical and irresponsible. It's thinly veiled corruption. It's a real scandal, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, why is the Prime Minister handing out so many contracts to McKinsey without a call for tenders? Why? The Honourable Minister for Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very clearly, uh, people aren't listening across the way because I've responded to this question many times. The problem in listening, because a couple of days ago, I heard the leader of the Conservatives tell Quebecers that the Canada dental care system simply didn't exist when there are 2,000 seniors in lévis le who have already registered to this apparently inexistent program. And uh, there's a high percentage of dental experts that have already signed up to the program. Mr. Speaker, the opportunities for Indigenous tourism are unlimited. In spectacular Northwest Territories, People have come to experience the unparalleled northern lights and our northern hospitality. Last November, we launched the first stream of Indigenous Tourism Fund, which currently supports over 150 projects. At least 50% of the tourism growth program will be invested in Indigenous tourism attractions. Can the Minister of Tourism tell us how our government is supporting reconciliation through infrastructure investments and Indigenous tourism. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for his question. Indigenous tourism is a pillar of our government's tourist growth strategy. And Canada has the potential to become a leader in the world when it comes to authentic Indigenous tourism. That is why NACA will be delivering a new funding to support large-scale up Indigenous tourism project. 
It will enable indigenous communities to scale up their projects and grow their own economy. Why, while conservatives have always looked down on indigenous communities, we will continue to support indigenous tourism growth through indigenous-led process. The Honourable Member for Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, air passengers who've been grossly mistreated by the big airlines are having to wait years to have their complaints heard. The backlog of complaints, right now it's over 70,000. And we just learned of a couple from British Columbia who finally got compensation only to have Air Canada turn around and sue them. The Liberals <laughs> promised the strongest air passenger protections in the world, but the reality is the new rules make it easier for the airlines to sue their customers. Strongest in the world, Mr. Speaker? What world is this minister on? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, Canadians work very hard to save some money to travel, to go see their loved ones, to take some well-deserved vacations. That, that's why they deserve a good service from the airline companies. The Conservatives didn't do anything, anything at all, until we came here and we put rules in place, and the airlines have to do better, Mr. Speaker, way much better. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Mr. Speaker, it's World Environment Day, and I'm so honoured that in Ottawa, visiting this next few days, are British Columbians who work night and day to protect our southern resident killer whale population. And yet this government makes decision after decision after decision that further threatens the survival. There are only 75 whales left in the Salish Seas of this population. The approval of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, even building the Trans Mountain Pipeline, increasing the risk of spills with the certainty of increased noise, doubling the Roberts Bank port in Vancouver with over the objections of scientists who told this government it would threaten the survival of the southern resident killer whales. Does the government understand the goal is to protect, not exterminate? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to reiterate a happy World Environment Day to the member from Saanich Gulf Islands, to all Greens, to Liberals, to NDPs, to Bloc Québécois, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Conservatives continue to deny the existence of climate change altogether, but just last year, our government announced important measures to help this country continue to lead the way in the fight against climate change. We published draft methane regulations to support cleaner energy. We introduced the world's first ever cap on oil and gas emissions, Mr. Speaker. We finalized our new EV availability standard to increase the supply of ZEDs, ZEVs across the country, and we committed to working with all stakeholders to deliver on a clean, green economy of the future. Let me do a couple of introductions. We do have a couple of, a couple of honourable visitors with us today. Uh, I wish to draw the attention of members of the presence of the gallery, uh, Mr. Salvatore, uh, Salvatore Sha, Sha, I'll do this correctly, Sha Kitano, and Mr. Juan Carlos Salazar, representing the International Civil Aviation and, as Council President and Secretary General, respectively. I would also like to draw the attention of members of the President's Gallery of the Honourable Barb Ramsey, Minister of Social Development and Seniors for the province of Prince Edward Island. And the Honourable Lisa Dempster, Minister of Labrador Affairs and Minister Responsible for Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Now we have a point of order from the Honourable Member for King's Hand. MC News, Canadian Malayalikilu'de Vartha Jalagam.